It's time for us to take a look at Siege of Valeria, a solo dice game from Daily Magic Games, whom we have to thank for sending along a review copy. Siege of Valeria was designed by a friend of the show, Glenn Flaherty, better known by some as the dude behind Board Games and Bourbon. It features artwork from, who would have guessed it, The Miko, and was published in 2022 after a rather successful Kickstarter. Siege of Valeria is a single player game that takes under an hour to play, even for your first learning game, and which gets quicker the more you play and get used to the cards and mechanics. It's recommended for ages eight up, which seems about right to us, depending on the eight year old, as this isn't a light game and there's lots of moving parts to keep track of. So Siege of Valeria is a castle defense board game where you must defend a fortress at Valeria's southernmost border from hordes of monsters and their nasty siege engines. Defeat wave after wave of enemies in an effort to destroy the last siege engine before a section of your wall falls. This game was a 2022 Golden Geek Best Solo Game nominee. Check out the components in this Golden Geek nominated single player game on our Siege of Valeria unboxing video on YouTube. There you'll see the very clear and concise rule book with lots of detailed examples, lots of graphics, lots of pictures and reference information for every single card in the game, which is great to see. You're going to get lots of square cards for the evil hordes and siege engines, smaller event and champion cards, a long skinny board, and a variety of different tokens. You also get a rather large number of custom dice in two colors. The component quality overall is good. The iconography used is very clear, and the various tokens are all unique wooden shapes that are easy to tell apart, and match the shapes and symbols used in previous Valeria games. Mm -hmm. This consistency across games is something we always appreciate. Now, one small bonus I personally really liked is that the dice here are pretty much standard D6 dice, with one to six on the various sides, but instead of just round pips, there's a small symbols that actually match the iconography and tokens. I just thought that was a nice touch. Now, while it would be nice if the card text were a bit bigger, you do quickly get to know the cards by their artwork and after a couple of plays, this isn't much of a problem. Now that you have some idea of what you're getting, let's dive into how to use all these dice and cards with an overview of play. So a game of Siege of Valeria is won by defeating every card in the Siege Engine deck, which involves destroying the ones that are out at the start of the game, as well as the ones that are still in the deck that will come out during play. This has to be done before any Siege Towers remain in the front row during activation. Or you've taken four damage, represented by flame tokens, or the enemy troop deck runs out. And that is way more ways to lose than ways to win. You start off a game by building the battlefield. You lay out the board, shuffle the troop deck, remove two from the game, just so you make sure you don't have perfect information, deal two cards to yourself as a starting hand, and then build a four by five grid out in front of the board with four cards lined up in front of each of the five turrets on the boards. You then shuffle the Siege Engine deck and deal out five of these at the top of each column so you end up with a battlefield that starts off five by five. Shuffle the Champion and Event deck and grab the dice. At the start of the game, you only get five red Soldier dice and two blue Holy dice. You can earn more of these during play, so set the rest of the dice and all the tokens to the side, and you're ready to start. So each round, you will roll all of your earned dice, the ones that you've, you've gotten during the game, and then you're going to resolve all of the siege engines in play. Now, the cards for these each list five different ranges, and in each range, there's a number there that is how much power you need to defeat the siege engine. Well, that number will either be black or highlighted. If a siege engine is currently at a highlighted range, the card goes off, doing some kind of terrible thing to you like causing you to lose dice, re-rolling your highest dice, reducing the number of dice you have, causing damage to your turrets, and more. Now, assuming you survive this assault, you then flip over the top event card and resolve this. The game, however, suggests skipping these for your first few games, which makes sense as most of them are negative effects, making the foes you are facing even tougher. Some are positive, though, so don't despair each time you have to draw one. After the event is resolved, you get to start fighting back. Now, this is done by spending dice from your just rolled dice pool and playing cards from your hand. In general, you have to spend as many pips on as many number of dice you want equal to or higher than a target card's cost to defeat. 
Some enemies, though, are magical troops and require that you spend a blue holy die in order to defeat them. Now, cards in your hand can be spent to add pips, reroll dice, double die numbers, and more. And really, the main chunk of this game is figuring out what dice to use and what cards to spend. That is the meat of this game is figuring out that puzzle. When attacking, unless you have a card that says otherwise, you can only attack troops that are in the front row, closest to the castle walls. Siege engines can be attacked almost any time, though they generally get easier to defeat the closer they get to your castle. When you defeat any enemy, you get to take that card into your hand, where it can be spent at any time, even right after you take it. Now, when you defeat a card, you may also earn some type of immediate bonus. These include gaining strength or magic tokens to boost your attacks, defeating additional adjacent enemies, or in the case of siege engines, you get to earn a champion. Champions represent powerful troops fighting on your side. When you gain a champion, you draw the top card from the deck and then must place it onto one of the five turrets on the board. Each champion gives you some form of powerful ability. Most of these can only be used once per turn. Additionally, any champion can be spent to remove an impact token from the turret they are in, but this removes the champion from play. After you're done spending all your dice and cards, the Vanguard attacks. Now, the Vanguard is the cards that are still in the front row, right next to your castle walls. Now, each card just does one impact damage to the turret it's in front of and is discarded. So remember, if any single turret takes four damage, you do lose the game. Once the Vanguard is cleared, you advance the battlefield. Everything slides down as far towards the castle as it can, and then it's time to add new troops. Any column without a siege engine gets a new one, a new siege engine added to that back row, and four new troops are drawn from the deck, whether there's room for them or not. Remember, you lose if this deck ever runs out. And lastly, any newly added siege engines slide up as close as they can. Now, assuming you haven't lost, play continues, with you rolling all your dice again and repeating the steps above until either you defeat the last engine, siege engine or your fortress falls. Roll dice, get hit by siege engines, resolve an event, spend your dice and cards, the vanguard attacks, enemies advance, then reinforce. A pretty smooth flow once you get used to it. Yeah, Siege of Lyra is a pretty straightforward game that I think does a pretty solid job of recreating the tension I imagine is part of a siege. I've never actually been part of one to know for sure, but I have to assume it's pretty tense. Now, this is not an easy game, and you can expect to lose handily your first couple of plays. And even when you do win after figuring out more of the game, it's not like it feels like you're winning until that very last siege engine goes down. It really does stay tense throughout. Now, we've always wanted solo and co-op games to be hard to win, and this one is really just hard enough. Now, I didn't get many plays in, but even in defeat... You felt like you could win. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes the dice just weren't on your side. Now, that said, this is a very abstract game. This is a math heavy card and dice game that's all about puzzling out the best way to combo your dice with your cards to both take out the siege engines and to mitigate the damage being done to your turrets each turn. Now, as with most Valeria games, there are plenty of ways to modify your dice and figuring out which modifiers to use when and in what order only adds to the maths and complexity. Now, what I found most interesting are the hard choices presented in this game. Like when troops are in the vanguard, do you let that vanguard troop crash against your walls, taking them out? Or do you try to, and, and taking a damage, or do you try to prevent that? I also like the decision of what to take out based on what it would do for me once the card entered your hand. So everything you take out becomes a card that you can then use for future turns. So sure, I could save my dice and let that big eight strength troop with two tokens on it crash into my walls and only take one impact damage. But if I take it out, I can now double one of my dice, possibly leading to a pretty easy takedown of its agent. There were no easy decisions here, and the replayability of the game is quite high. The randomness of the decks means that even if you know how to defeat something, you're likely going to have a completely different set of tools mm. the next time you face it. Now, one of the keys to playing Siege of Valeria well and increasing your odds of winning is getting to know the cards that are in the deck, including both the Siege deck as well as the um, troop deck. 
don't do what I did the first play and not even read what the siege engines that are up in front of you do until they were in range to attack. I was so focused on the Vanguard and the cards up front that I was just kind of like, yeah, yeah, they're siege engines. I'll worry about those later. That led to a very quick loss for me as I didn't realize that a siege engine could do a certain thing where it was doing two impact to me on a tower that had already had two flame tokens on it. While playing to see what happens can be fun, you may want to actually read through the entire deck of cards, either before you play or after your first learning game, just to play a learning game, just to learn the mechanics without the strategy. Now, while system mastery is important, for me, it's something that would come from multiple plays. If you want to up your odds of victory, though, reading ahead is definitely recommended. Now, my biggest complaint about this game is just how much stuff there is to keep track of. It's just, it's fiddly. It's, it's one of the more fiddly games I've played. Now, some of this is because of the dice management, because you have all these piles of two different types of dice. You've got your pile of red dice that you've earned and your blue dice you've earned. And then you've got the pile that you haven't earned on the side. And then once your turn starts out of those piles you have earned, you've got to keep track of which ones you've spent already and which ones you haven't. And then there's cards that add dice where you get to take them from the unused dice and put them with your dice. And then there's cards that you, you I forget the term, but banish and you lose those dice. And then other dice you sometimes carry over. And there's all kinds of management of dice. What I strongly suggest when playing this is using a dice tray or tower to manage it. Um, thankfully, my particular dice tray has two sides, a top and a bottom, and that worked really well, for me, at least for me, to keep track of what I've spent and what I haven't. So I didn't find the dice management too awkward, but I did find that overall the game took up a bit more space than I wanted it to. Yeah. I'm not a solo gamer, so it might be my expectations were misaligned. But I felt like it needed more table than I wanted to give up for a solo game. Now, along with the dice and, and the amount of space the game takes up, you also have all these different cards, and every card has its own unique ability. After the first few rounds, every time I played up with this game, I've ended up with a large hand of cards to manage, and what to spend and keeping track of those was a little difficult. And then with that are all the counters you can earn. So there's strength counters, and then there's magic counters, and you can have a pile you've earned, and you can spend those to get plus one, but some of them also end up out on the board and they can build up out there. And then there's each event somehow changes the rules that turn. And sometimes you have to remember the event that's currently in play because it affects the entire rounds, while other times it just does a single point thing. And while I get that the entire point of this game, what the draw is, is that this is a big puzzle and you have all these pieces to manage. It's really easy, I found, to miss something. So I think coming up with a standard way of sorting your cards may be the key here. Though that will be a very personal choice, as it's not as simple as just a few suits to manage. Now, I also found that the game did feel, feel a little repetitive after a small number of plays. Um, for the number of cards in the game, I was surprised to see how many were the same card, like just multiple copies of the same card. There's lots of duplication. And even the Siege Engines, there aren't that many in that deck, and they aren't all unique. There's at least two or three copies of each of them. For me, this is a game that I would sit down and play and I play it once. And if I won, I'm done. I won Siege of Valeria. Okay, put it away. Move on to something else. But if I lost, I try again. Let's try a second time. But after that second time, I found I was done. Every time I sat down to play the game. I'm like, oh, I didn't win this time. We'll try it again some other time. And then I would put it back on my shelf only to bring it out, I don't know, a couple of weeks later. And again, I played one or two games. One if I won, two if I lost. Now, I do know there's an expansion out there that I hear makes the game more variable, more interesting and more replayable, especially in a single sitting, that adds a whole campaign element about improving your forces. And I got to say, it sounds fantastic. I do own it, and I do plan to try it next, but I haven't even touched it yet. I haven't even read the rules, because I wanted to review the base game as a standalone experience for anyone who just goes into a store and picks it up without the, without the expansion. Now, while I agree there is a repetitiveness, you can't avoid that. I think the randomness of the cards in the game can overcome that. But you have to be okay with that randomness and that of the dice, which, of course, is going to turn off many a Euro lover. Yeah, this is not a perfect information, make your opening move, plan ahead. Once you see the cards out, engage your master plan. There is definitely a lot of variability. Um, while the game does reward strategy, it is very tactical. Now, take all of these complaints that, that I would say probably both of us have, especially mine with a grain of salt, because I am not a solo gamer. I've never been a solo board gamer. If it's just me and there's no one else to play with, I'm going to go online and play some games instead of break out a game like Siege of Valeria. It's very likely that someone who does enjoy solo board gaming isn't going to mind 
fiddliness, the things you have to track, the amount of table space it takes up, how long it takes to set up and put away. They'll probably enjoy the system mastery required by learning all the cards and playing repetitively and, and enjoy the learning curve of how much better they get at the game as they start to master those elements. And they're probably going to eventually learn the count of each card in the deck and know to prepare for that whatever big 12 monster that you know is going to come sometime. And they're probably going to enjoy playing repetitively until they win. But that's just not how I play games. Yeah, indeed. I think it is the repetitiveness that is absolutely something that solo gamers embrace. Uh, and if you do, it's not like there aren't enough cards. In fact, there seem to be just the right amount of cards for the puzzle they have posed. So overall, I thought Siege of Valeria was a solid solo game experience, even as someone who doesn't normally enjoy single player games. It was challenging enough to make me want to keep trying, but it's just a little too fiddly for my taste. Now, one thing that did stick out, though, is as a dice game, it didn't feel overly random. The number of the cards, like almost all the cards in the game, pretty much every card manipulates the dice in some way or gives you that extra strength you may be missing or whatever. And it never made me feel like my game was in the hands of fate. It always felt like it was something I chose to do that was either causing me to win or lose. Agreed. Similarly, not a solo player, but I could see how it was a game that draws players in and makes them want to solve that puzzle provided with each new play. So if you enjoy solo gaming, you're probably going to want to pick up Siege of Valeria, a solid dice-driven tower defense game that rewards multiple plays and really getting to know the cards. If you like puzzles and trying to figure out the best possible card and dice combo, you're probably going to love the core mechanics of this game. Soon enough, you'll find yourself praying for certain forces to emerge so you can better take on the encroaching siege engines. Now, if you don't normally enjoy playing games on your own, I don't know if this game would win you over. I did find it more entertaining and engaging than some solo games I've tried, but I would still rather play a multiplayer game over this. And to be fair, the Valeria series on its own offers me plenty of options there. I'm in full agreement here. I think Mo and I fall in the same place for solo gaming. We're more about the social aspects of board games and solo play doesn't deliver on that. Plus, yeah. there's no one else to help you set up and tear down. That's true. Now, if you just dig Valeria games, I say we have fair disclosure here. We're kind of Valeria fanboys around here. Um, it's probably worth picking this game up to complete your collection. There's enough Valeria about this game between the Miko's artwork, the strength and magic resources, the fact you can't use magic on its own. It's got to be combined with strength. The familiar champion cards with their different factions. The monstrous hordes are all even going to look familiar. And of course, the spending of dice to do things. That just makes this feel like a Valeria game, though a Valeria game with a very different taste than the rest of them. Well, thank you for joining us for this review of The Siege of Valeria, the last of the Valeria small box games that we have reviewed. When you're done here, we welcome you to check out our reviews of Thrones of Valeria, and Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, and then let us know which of these three new Valeria games you enjoyed most. Now, for me, it's time to crack open Siege of Valeria campaign expansion and see what that adds to the game and see if it turns Siege into more of a game for me. <laughs>